everyone, welcome to Woolen Spinning. My name is Rachel. It is Tuesday, April 5th, 2022. And uh, I, I hope you're well. <laughs> I hope this finds you well. How are you? Uh, we are sort of at a new time. This will be permanent and uh, it will be every other Tuesday. Welcome. I hope that everybody is doing really well. We have this really weird changeable weather going on right now. It's raining and then it's sunny and then it's cloudy and then it's windy. It's been all over the place. I know of several people who have, don't have any power and have been with an out power for, for a couple of days. Um, we've just got this like crazy cold wind and poor James, he's been um, having to play soccer in the rain and the cold and now Nora's gonna have to do that today too. So <laughs> I just feel badly for them. Welcome everybody, it's good to see Kim is here and Carly, good to see you Carly, it's been a while. Vicki, uh, Kathy is here and Rebecca from Rankin Inlet. Um, Charlotte and uh, Laura is here, Mandy, Sam, Dagmar, uh, Kelly, Amanda, Glenda, Becca is here, Dana, thank you everybody for being here. It means a lot to me that you're here. Uh, I, uh, I hope that uh, those of you who are in the UK, because there's quite a few of you in the chat today that are, that are in the UK, thank you so much for being here. And uh, thank you for uh, taking the time out of your evening to spend it with us. And for those where it's during the day, thank you for taking the time during the day. I really appreciate that. We have quite a full show today, um, but I'm hoping it won't be too, too bad. I've got my finished farmhouse to just talk about. I'll, I won't talk about it for long. There's just a couple of things that I wanted to highlight about it if you're thinking about knitting it. I've got some plied samples here that I thought we could talk about. That will be probably the bulk of the show. I've got some Cormo singles that I've wound off. I'll talk about that. And I have, uh, I started my wool and honey again. <laughs> it's not the pattern, it's the knitter. Um, so we'll talk about that. And, uh, and then we've got a little bit of community participation today. I didn't do a ton of community participation today because I wanted to try a slightly different format for it. So you guys will have to let me know what you think. Um, sometimes I find it hard to be reading like separate screens and looking like where to look and what to look at. And so, um, I lose track of like where I am when I'm reading. So I thought, let's put it in the show. So let me know what you think. That's coming up later. Oh, Sam, we're uh, matching our stone crop uh, pullover. She's wearing the same jumper. This is the Sparks of Grey by Melanie Berg. I actually have a pull in it. I noticed that I've got a fix. Um, I think it got caught on something. So there's there's a pull in it. But um, I wear this all the time. I was really, really cold. I ended up eating lunch a little bit early because of course we're streaming at noon. And um, I just felt so cold afterwards. And then would you believe it? I, I had my, my teacup, I had it full, you know, ready to go, and I dropped it. It didn't break, it was this mug. It was like right on the counter, but it was like, when I put it down, it's almost like my hand like slipped, and it just tipped over. It was the weirdest thing. I was sort of, I sort of stood there shocked for a minute and kind of was like, what is going on? <laughs> Anyways, I made more tea and got myself settled, and <laughs> and here we are. So let's run the intro credits and um, I'll see you guys on the other side and we'll, we'll get into all this stuff that I have to share with you. So the intro credits are a great chance for me to just quickly catch up with wh where, what people are doing, where they are. I want to know what you guys are up to. Kim is spinning Yorkshire Terrier fur. Um, she says it's almost as terrible as poodle fur, but not as slick. And then in response, Sam says, you're giving me the heebie-jeebies. I don't know what it is about Shangora. It just gives me the heebie-jeebies. So Sam, I'm right there with you. Um, I did just spin a skein, a little mini skein. I, I don't think I have it within reaching distance, but I, do, I did just spin a, um, a skein of Angora, rabbit Angora. Um, and I, 
I've never been happy with my Angora yarns. And this is for the School of Sweet Georgia luxury workshops that's gonna be filmed later this spring. And then it's gonna be released, I think sometime in the summer. And um, it, it, for the first time, I got the results that I wanted and I got the yarn that I wanted and I spun it the way that I wanted and it just all aligned and worked. But I think that part of that was, it's just practice. I've spun, I spun it here and there quite often. And I think it's often enough and spinning all of these other fibers as well on top of it, you know, spinning silk and the plant-based fibers and cotton and flax and all these different things that I think I've, finally gotten to that point where I can sit down and spin something like Angora and get what I want. Um, I'm not saying it's going to work every time, but for those who have sort of not delved into some of the other fibers just yet and are still sort of, um, haven't had the opportunity maybe, um, I would encourage you to start trying some of these other fibers and, and working up your confidence because I think finally after how many years of spinning, I started in 2007. So, you know, I'm getting up there in terms of the number of years that I've been spinning for. And I'm finally at that point where I spun the Angora and I was like, nailed it. And not in an egotistical way, just in a actually quite humbled kind of, wow, this took a long time to get to this point kind of a way. So definitely, definitely something to think about. Um, having something click is so satisfying. Congratulations on the Angora yarn. Thanks, you guys. That's Amanda and Rebecca. Thank you. Uh, so Dana is spinning some Merino Cormo that she combed. She tried her very fast flyer yesterday after the Wool Circle show. Uh, so the Wool Circle streams on Monday mornings. And that's for uh, patrons of, of that tier on Patreon. Um, and she was actually able to spin some silk hankies. And actually, Dana, I saw your photo on Slack just before we started here. And I was going to respond. I was going to do that after the show. So yeah, welcome Ruth. She's got hot tea. She's got the screen on. That's awesome. And Sam says she put on her strong crop because she wanted something cuddly, snuggly. It's funny. I don't find this sweater really super warm. And I think it's because it's the commercial yarn. The green is the superwash Targi. It's Katrina's base. I love the yarn. It's a fantastic yarn, but I don't find it super warm. And then it's superwash Targi for the hand spun that I used. It was a three ply that I used for the body, for the color work of the sweater. And it's just not that warm. So I threw a shawl on over top and I'm, I'm a little bit warmer. Sam says you give me hope. Oh, thank you, Sam. I'm glad I'm, I'm here to inspire, <laughs> inspire and motivate, light a fire under our butts. So one of the things that I have been wanting to do is I've been really hoping that I can uh, spindle spin for a sweater. That's kind of my long-term goal. And I was sort of hoping to have it done this year and that I could maybe at least cast it on this year. And I'm spinning away and I'm spinning away and I'm doing my thing. And I was sort of like, I don't really know if I'm gonna like this yarn. Like what if I spin all this yarn and I don't like it? So I thought, you know what? I better clear off my spindles and maybe I should like see if, um, oh, I don't have the photo queued up for you guys. Okay, hang on, let me queue up the photo for you. Give me two seconds here and I'll talk while I'm doing this. Um, and I thought, you know, I've got all of these spindles. I've been carrying them around with me and I've been trying to like, every time I have it, you know, something that I'm not, do that I'm not really doing, like I've been really trying hard to um, spin on my spindles and really making a conscious effort to do that. And I've been really, really inspired by Diana Twist, who's part of our community. She's a prolific spindle spinner. She's amazing. Um, and she's very forthcoming with her knowledge. And I have just been so inspired by her over the years with her spindle spinning. And of course I've got you know her and I've got Kim McKenna as well, um, who's a very well-known spinner. Um, I've got both of them kind of here. They're just amazing spinners in their own right and, you know, amazing spindle spinners. And they're constantly sharing new spindles with, with us and, you know, talking about them. And I just thought, you know, I've, I've been spinning up on all of my, mainly my support spindles. I've been spinning up all of these singles onto my support spindles. And I was like, what if I don't like this yarn? Because this Cormo is, it, it's okay. It's beautiful fiber. And the pin drafted roving that Liz did from Kingdom Fleece and Fiber, it's beautiful. Um, but there are neps in it that, that were in there from before. And um, it's not super, super smooth. And you know, it's, it's it, it looks really lovely, but it's actually chocker block full of sort of just 
from the original prep, um, like from the original fleece, there's, there's just some inconsistencies in it. And um, I was spinning it on the wheel and I was really inspired by Dorothy, who's part of our community. Um, from her saying like, if it's not working on the wheel, what about pivoting and doing it like on spindles and just doing it a different way? And I thought, bingo, you got it, Dorothy. So I pivoted to using this fiber on my support spindles because with my support spindles, I'm still learning. It doesn't have to be perfect. And so it was like, if there's a thick spot that goes through, so what? If there's a thin spot that goes through, so what? It's beginner yarn. It's a beginner um, experience. And I, I really kind of felt validated and um, like I was being given permission almost to be in that role again and not be expert um, with my support spindles. And that came totally from, from my friend Diana. And so I, I, I've been walking around like since whatever whenever it was that I started this sometime back in in the fall with these spindles kind of with two or three at a time and just kind of when I get a chance spinning we were driving into Vancouver on Saturday to the white caps game and I spun the whole way there um it was too I was driving on the way back because it was raining and it was quite dark and Mike finds it really hard to drive when it's like that so I drove home um and it was probably a bit it wouldn't have been great to spindle on the way home when it's dark and he's trying to concentrate and I'm like my arms like <laughs> going across him as he's driving um but I sort of thought you know what I'm filling up all of these spindles why don't I wind them all off and put them onto storage bobbins and I'll just do it randomly I'll just wind them all off and as you guys are, are laughing and joking um I I'm, I used my very fancy extremely expensive lazy Kate <laughs> with rocks and uh, I got this this tip from Diana um, to when you're so this spindle is my one of my Allen Berry spindles and it winds off really nicely with the basket upward upright. But with some of my other spindles like these ones from uh, yarn spindles, um, the spindles are a bit shorter and it worked really well. Diana tips her basket on its side and weights it down with rock. And I thought, well, I'll give it a try because the other way is not working. It worked like a charm. It was just perfect. So I wound them all off and what I did was each spindle that I did, I wound onto a different bobbin. And um, as one bobbin looked kind of fuller than the other ones, then I would take the one that was more empty and I would wind those spin singles off. And then, you know, I get to the end of that spindle and I'd look at the bobbins, which one looks the most empty and wind off onto that one next. So these are sectional warping bobbins. Um, these are for a sectional warping setup uh, from Leclerc, but they're fantastic for winding off singles. So if you have access to these and you can buy them, they're not super expensive. Um, although they are a little bit more than they used to be. Uh, they're great, they're, I use them like basically exclusively for uh, winding off singles and when I start sectionally warping and stuff in, in the future I probably will have to reclaim a whole bunch of them um, but I have I, I have more than I need for my my spool rack um, and so I've wound all of this off I've chosen from my spindle stash um, about three spindles and as you can see on the far right hand side of your screen um, I even have a support spindle over there because when I'm at soccer sometimes I can't sit down um, so I started a support spindle so that's one of my Bosworth spindles and uh, I have just been you know I, I put that those singles in here somewhere <laughs> they're in there somewhere and um, what I actually am going to do in the next two weeks so before we podcast next time is I'll create a two ply, a three ply, and a four ply yarn. And that will inform where to go from here and what to do in terms of like spindle, um, in terms of, of the finished yarn. Um, I, because the yarn is a little bit inconsistent, it's a little bit thick and thin in places, it's beginner yarn, there's neps, um, there's uh, areas where the, the fiber didn't draft out really super nicely. What I thought was if I did a multiply yarn, it would make it really round. It would make it a slightly higher knitting gauge, but that's fine. Um, and if I give it a nice sort of somewhere between a medium and a tight ply, which bridges us into the next thing I wanted to talk about, um, it'll, it'll give it that sort of durability that I 
need slash want for a sweater. And then I'll match the gauge to a sweater pattern that, that I'd like to make next. I, I don't know what that'll be. It'll depend on the gauge. But that was sort of my, I, my thought around winding the singles off to four bobbins and continuing to distribute the singles across the different bobbins to possibly do a four ply. That's kind of in the back of my mind. Um, the other thing is I took, once I had cleared off the spindles, I started saying this a moment ago and then I interrupted myself. Um, I cleared off my spindles and I chose uh, three, I think it was three of my spindles, one of my Allen Berries, one of these ones, the yarn spindles and my Silly Salmon. And I put them sort of back in the in the bag that I've been carrying around. And those will be the three that I focus on for the next little while. And so I'll fill those ones up, fill them up. I probably won't fill them all the way up. I'll get to a point where I'm like, okay, I'm done with these three. I'll wind off those singles and I'll take another three spindles and I'll work on those and I'll fill those up, fill them up and then wind those off. And I think just focusing on, on two or three spindles at a time, um, I think sort of helps you to amass for me anyways, helps me to amass a certain number of singles. Like some of these actually got are quite, there's quite a lot of singles on there on some of them. Um, and just to really enjoy those spindles for, for that period of time and then sort of put them aside and work with the next group and, and compare and contrast what I like, what I don't like, what, what are some of the things I'm thinking about when I'm spinning on each of them? How do they compare to one another? Um, the different shapes and what I like. So I thought that that would be something that I would find really helpful in sort of learning more about the spindles that I have and thinking toward the future of what I might want to add, which right now I'm like, no more spindles, nothing. But you know, down the road, there might be one or two that I, that I would be interested in. So, um, <laughs> uh, Becca says she has the same Kate. It was yours as expensive as mine. I mean, I felt it was, I was very lush for having bought one. I mean, hers is red. Ooh, it's even more luxurious. Uh, Kathy has the same one as well. Minus the rocks. Ooh, you need to get the rocks. My rocks are from Northern British Columbia from a place called Muncho Lake. For those who know where that is. Um, the kids absolutely loved these sort of style of rocks that are up there and um, we just did the rock unit in grade four for James's stuff and I can't remember for the life of me what they're all called what these ones are called they're they might be metamorphic rock anyways they're really 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 heavy so I kind of grabbed them and I've claimed them for my lazy Kate um let me see. I'm just catching up with chat. The rocks are a great idea. I could pull from my collection. I, I, I know I have a fellow, uh, rock collector. Um, Becca and I both collect rocks. I usually just have random crap in the bottom to weight it. <laughs> I, can, I can see that too. Cause my basket, it, it had, um, I had to go and find it actually. It was full of weaving bobbins <laughs> for a project that I'm working on right now on the Jack. And, um, yeah, it was, it had like, um, seven or eight, uh, weaving, um, not the bobbin, sorry, the shuttles had like eight shuttles in it. Pam was wondering if I'll ply on a spindle. I, I don't know. Um, the only reason why I pause is because I have a pound of this fiber. I think it's actually a little bit more. And the, I, the thought of plying a pound on spindles, um, I have a steampunk, uh, gear head spindle that I love for applying. Katrina has the same one and so does Diana. And it was Diana that kind of got me and Katrina onto them. It's a fantastic spindle for spinning, uh, sorry, for plying. Um, but the, I, the thought of, of plying like eight or 900 yards of yarn, um, if I can get that for a sweater, cause if it's a four ply, it won't be as much yardage. Like if you do a two ply, I'll get probably three or 4,000 yards of yarn. But if I do a four ply, it'll probably be sub a thousand. And so, um, I say that, but it might be more, I don't know, maybe we'll see. Um, it's spinning pretty fine. I I'm just not sure that I want to do that on a spindle. I'm, I'm thinking out loud and I think part of it is that I just, the idea of winding all of those plying balls to ply that on a spindle, I, I'm not sure my holding the plying ball and doing that. Like I just, I can't see myself doing that. So, uh, yeah. Welcome Alex. Um, how do you join the singles on one bob and do you wet felt them? Yes, Sean, a great question or something different. I've just been wet felting them together. So I put the two singles together and I kind of, um, just, you know, wet my fingers and, and, um, sort of smush them together. And I suspect what's going to happen is as I'm plying off, there's going to be sections where 
they don't stick together where they come apart. I'll just nestle that, that new singles into the yarn and keep on going just like you normally would. So yeah. Kathy says she drafts out the fluffy bit from the end and use the next spindle to twist to the join. Oh, that's a great idea, Kathy. Good idea. Yeah. So, um, that's that project. So I've got that all wound off. Those are the photos that I wanted to share with you. That's my silly salmon. I don't know if you saw that, that little pink spindle up in the corner there on that last photo. That's my silly salmon. So, um, that one is one of my favorite spindles and my yarn spindles, the one right here, that's the yellow one and the one two in from there, the third one from the left, um, with the red tip, those, those two are the yarn spindles. Um, he's literally yarn spindles on Instagram. I think he's from, is he in Maine? I love those spindles. One of them has a metal tip and the other one has a wooden tip. They're both awesome. It doesn't matter. They're both the same. So... So what should we talk about next? Let's do the Tofino road trip. It's sitting right here. This was um, a three ply fractal from two braids of fiber. So there was um, a total of eight ounces of fiber, hundred and about 230 grams of fiber in total. It's about 113 grams per four ounce braids. Um, and what I did was I took each of the braids and I divided it down so that I had um, 80, was it 75 or 80 grams per, um, I think it was 80, um, uh, per sort of three bundles, if you will, and spun it as a three ply, three ply fractal. So the first singles was spun end to end, uh, continuous back, high twist. No, actually it wasn't that high twist. It was sort of like a medium high twist, somewhere in between. And then the second one I stripped twice and the third one I only stripped four times I feel like it wasn't a ton of stripping I didn't like strip and strip and strip and strip because I really like that slow transition of color that's something that I, I have found over the years that I really really like um, so what I did on the weekend and I had been saving this for the wool circle so the wool circle is the live stream that happens for the wool circle members on patreon uh, patreon.com slash wool and spinning thank you for your support because you are who keeps the show on the air week in week out so thank you so much um the wool circle members i was saving it for them and i was going to go through this exercise in real time on the show and because of spinning through a lot of luxury fibers right now together we're working on angora we've done we just did llama and alpaca we just did silks yesterday um, and we've been really working through the fibers that are in the kit for the School of Sweet Georgia workshop that's coming up, like I said. And um, we just, this was getting put off and put off and put off. And it's not because I have time to apply it right now. Um, it's more that I just want to know what my plan is. Because as soon as my magic craft becomes free again, and this luxury workshop spinning is finished, um, that is what's going to happen next, is plying this. And so what I did was I, and this is what we were gonna do on the wool circle, was I actually took the the three bobbins, the three um, that I had spun, I'd already rewound them to the first spun end. We'd covered that in another show recently. And I actually put them on the wheel and I went through and where is the, I have a video to show you. Let me see if I can do that for you. And I, I plied up three different um, skeins so that we would have um, some comparison. So let me show you how I did that and why I did that. And I just need to find, why is this not working? <laughs> like, what is going on? Um, the, uh, <laughs> sometimes, honestly, you guys, sometimes. Okay, so this, this is gonna mess up for a second, so let me just move it down. Okay, so what I did was I started with the setup. I've, I've got my rings, my rings, applying through the rings back here. So I've got my Lazy Kate down below, and then I loop my singles up through, the la through my rack. This is like a towel rack that you would put on the back of like a bathroom door. 
Um, you can, Kim McKenna teaches it, the nuances to spinning yarn in the, the School of Sweet Georgia. She does hers on a spring-loaded uh, shower curtain rod, but there's no like doorways or archways in our house where I could suspend something like that. So this works really, really well. And I put it on the back of my door and it just acts as like, it means your yarn literally has to turn the corner and it naturally tensions it. So it works beautifully for that. And um, I started off with the two treadles. So treadle, because remember I have a double treadle. So when I say two treadles, I'm not talking about one, two. I'm talking about one, two, because you need a full rotation of the drive wheel. Um, and that two treadles was also for wind on. So one and on, one and on. So that created this really, really lofty yarn. Um, it's not low twist, but it's certainly not high twist. And, and I would even, I, I would be loath to say even that it's a medium twist. This reminded me a lot of like what the commercial yarns are like that you find in the yarn shop. Um, they have just enough twist to hold them together. They aren't super low twist, but they're not quite twisted enough. Um, it's balanced, it hangs beautifully, but it's got a lot of loft. And um, I'll show that to you in the other photos. And then I did a medium twist. And so that was four treadles. So one, two, three, and on. One, two, three, and on. And that created this uh, medium twist yarn. And it's got a really nice twist angle. It's around 40 degrees. Um, and it, it really made a nice yarn. And because this is BFL, it does have a little bit of a halo. Those tips and butts are sticking out no matter what you do but it's got that sheen, right? Cause it's got that silk content in it. So that was the medium. See if I can get it in front of my face to get it to focus. Um, and then finally was the high twist. And the high twist was actually quite difficult to ply. I found myself having to really like treadle um, intentionally. I had to really sit there and like count. And you can even see when they, they that, that photo was from when they were wet even wet the high twist skein wanted to wanted to roll on itself and wanted to balance its twist so um you know off the top of my head like just sort of you know not knowing anything not having sampled it not having knit with it not having done a woven sample with it not having done anything i would say even now washed washed and um snapped so when i talk about snapping it's like just going like this to even out the twist you go all the way around and do that even now it it wants to uh twist on itself to balance itself um you could even add a little bit more twist to this and you could make an aw awesome cabled yarn and this is that wet photo again see how that high twist skein wants to wants to twist the thing with this yarn is it's the it's the lowest in terms of the halo and it doesn't have any loft if you look at the three skeins the the loftiest is the lower twist yarn the medium is sort of right smack in the middle it's almost like the skeins get smaller. So you can see how at the top here, this lower twist yarn, that, that twist angle is a little bit more, you know, it's lower, but it's got that loft. It's gonna fill that space on the store shelf. It's gonna make it look like it's a lot more yarn. And um, the the high twist singles, you know, it's, it's a lot more of a twist angle. It's a lot higher twist angle. It doesn't have that loft. It doesn't take up that space. Um, it's literally a smaller gauge and if you hold this under a little bit of tension um, And even if even if you don't actually let's talk about elasticity first. There's there's no elasticity in this yarn and I Spun this to have low elasticity. I didn't pre-draft I didn't um, I used my continuous backwards draft like I normally do um, I put a, a sort of a medium amount of twist in it, but I didn't um, really like, but I did smooth. I, I didn't leave a lot of the air in the singles like I normally would. Um, I smoothed quite, quite intentionally through this, through this spin. And of course what ends up resulting in this high twist yarn is there's no elasticity. Um, it almost is a little bit lifeless, you know, even though it wants to jump back on itself and it wants to apply to balance, it's a little bit lifeless. Um, and it makes me wonder in the knitting and spin it in knitting and weaving whether or not it would bias quite badly. I don't know. Some of the yarns that I think are going to bias, they don't. And then some of the yarns that I don't think will bias, they do. So now the medium twist yarn in terms of elasticity, it's not got a lot either. It's, it's pretty, 
pretty inelastic and this is the yarn that I will use to ply with. So this will be the yarn that I that I ply the entire skein with. Um, it has a little bit more loft than the high twist sample um, but it wouldn't take up that much that much space on a on a on a shelf at a store um, it wouldn't have that that air and that loft in it it just it's um, but it has a little bit more uh, uh, light in it or uh, lightness in it and a little bit more loft um, a little bit more life than the high twist sample this one this one still has a little bit of of oomph in it this one is the most um, it has a little bit of elasticity and um, Again, it's, you know, the highest in terms of loft and, and space that it takes up. So that plying compression makes a difference in how it feels and behaves. Absolutely. And it totally and completely changes the hand of the yarn. And it's one thing for you guys to see my samples and to see them in a video and to see them in a photo and to see how I did them. Um, it's another thing to do it yourselves. So I would highly recommend that you go through this process. And I would do a few, um, you know, I would do, uh, you know, get some, some fiber from your stash that is just a small amount. You don't need a lot. Um, spin, uh, don't pre-draft and just spin a sample. You can always bracelet ply it if you want. Um, you'll wrap your singles around your, around your hand and bracelet ply, um, to do a, you know, media, a low, medium and high twist ply. Um, and then pre-draft some fiber and, um, you know, pre-draft it out and get that air in there and get that loft and, and, um, so that when you go to wash it, those fibers have space to, for that crimp to reactivate and see if you can spin a, a more elastic yarn and see what, what that does in the low, medium and high twist yarns. And depending on what you're looking for, if you want a shawl that's going to drape and hang, and it's going to block out really beautifully, you might not want a ton of elasticity. Um, but if you're wearing a, a sweater, if you're knitting or spinning for a sweater where you've got bobbles that need to be lofty and bouncy and need to hold their shape, you might want to multiply yarn, but that has that bounce and that sproying to it. So pre-drafting equals more elasticity. Absolutely, Rebecca. Yeah. It's all about your prep. That's why the woolen yarns are so elastic, right? It's why they work so beautifully in color work because you're holding your yarn under a slight amount of tension around your knitting needles and you're knitting your color work. And then when you go to wash it, that yarn, you know, reactivates and it's and it just settles in like a like a watercolor right it all locks in those scales open up they embrace their neighbor they lock in and it creates that beautiful color work whereas with a sweater like this worsted spun worsted finished um you're not going to have that same color work effect that you'll get with uh with wool and spun especially wool and spun two ply yarns that are kind of resisting each other and turning out on themselves anyways and they kind of you know end up pushing into each other and like i said they create that beautiful watercolor effect so so much to think about so much to think about Okay, let's talk about farmhouse. I wanted to highlight a couple of things about this sweater, but we have talked about it a little bit. So um, this is farmhouse. It's a pattern by Amy Christoph Christoffers. It has pockets. I lengthened it. Um, it's knit in an Aran weight yarn. So I used Cascade Ecological. I had it in my stash. I've been trying to knit through some of these stashed yarns that I've held on to for a really super long time. This um, had been damaged quite badly and I ended up through the bottom basically like from the hem all the way up to about here it's like join 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 <laughs> i think i had to weave in like you know i i lost count after 40 ends that i had to weave in to finish it it didn't use a ton of yarn it only used 1.5 skeins of the cascade eco um those skeins are huge there's like 400 yards per skein and um I, I only used one and a half yards. I did knit the smallest size um, because I knew that with the ease and, and how it would fit that it would that it would be about right. She doesn't actually say anything in the pattern about when to stop your buttonholes. So I ended up stopping them uh, just after I did one more buttonhole after I divided for my uh, or sorry after I joined to do the yoke. So this is a bottom up sweater. Um, you start at the bottom here, you work your ribbing you're doing your collar and your button band at the same time, which is really nice because when you're done, you're done. Um, and then you stop at the beginning before you cast on, you, you do your uh, pocket linings. 
So you knit those, you put them off to the side, and then you continue on with your, your sweater. When you get to that point um, where you're at the top of your pocket, you cast on, and then you add your held stitches from your pocket lining. Uh, you go and do your seaming after the fact. So these are all seamed inside, super easy to do. And then I sewed on my buttons afterwards. And actually, an up close of these buttons, they they're they fade to dark, so they're light fading to dark. And I actually did buy them for this yarn for this sweater. So um, I was actually sewing them on um, this morning. So once you uh, join for your raglan, you work your raglan in decreases all the way up. And this is what I didn't like about this pattern. Once I've worn it for a little while and I've kind of you know forgotten about it, um, it, it won't be a big a big deal. Um, but I don't love this big thick raglan. Um, I wish I had done the decreases facing the other way so that this would have just faded in. Um, I don't mind the line on this side, but I don't love the line on this side. And I just needed to do the decreases the opposite way. Um, and I, I just kind of halfway through, I was like, oh shoot. But I, at that point I was not going to rip back. And I, I, there were so many places where I had to join new yarn and look, you know, pull out from the ball until there was this, another stable section of yarn. Cause it's just, it's not new yarn. It's been, um, I think I bought this yarn in 2006 and it's been sitting in my stash and it disintegrates, it dissolves. And it, it, you know, there was one side of the, of this, of one of the skeins that was quite badly damaged just from being skeined and being in my stash. And um, sure enough, that was, um, you know, enough to do that damage. So I, I, di I just didn't want to rip back and try to like fix all of that, those joins again. Um, but that is one thing that I would check. And then at the top, you end up with only a few stitches that finishes off your sleeve. And it doesn't say this in the pattern, but I ended up doing um, a three three stitch decrease so that things would kind of line up nicely and finish off with a V. Um, but like I said, if I could do this again, I would do that differently. After you're finished that, um, you cast off your back neck and you keep your fronts active. You keep them on your needles and you finish off your collar. So you knit a certain number of rows on the one side and you break your yarn, you finish the, a number of stitches on the other side, and then you do a three needle bind off down the back here and that's what gives that nice seam. So no, no finishing. You could totally graft this if you wanted to. Um, I just, um, I don't love grafting in, in rib. It's not my favorite thing. I've never done it in a way that I like the, the finished results. So I was like three needle bind off. You're my friend. Um, the other modification that I made, uh, well, I didn't really make any modifications. So the only modification that I made was I did lengthen the cardigan. Um, so I think in the pattern, it's like a 13 inch body. If that, if my memory serves, I think it's 13 inches and I lengthened it to about, I was going to say 17 and then I paused because I actually think that I made it a bit longer than that. I think it ended up being more like 19 inches long. It's not, I know it's not 20. Um, the sleeves are 19 inches, so it must've been 19 inches. <laughs> logic sometimes it's very difficult um i think i think it's 19 inches and the reason for that is because wearing it open this is probably more how i'll wear it and wearing it open and kind of drapey like this where it kind of comes just comes down over your bum it's nice and warm that's how i'll wear it and um having it stop at like 13 inches and having the pockets right here um it's just not my my style and if you guys know me i do tend to prefer slightly longer cardigans. With the length of my torso, how short my legs are, it just kind of works. So that is that. And then actually part of the reason for unbuttoning this is I was going to show you the beginnings of wool and honey. So this yarn is from Disdaro Ranch. It's their Copaca. So it's Corydale and Alpaca. And I haven't had an, um, any kind of a reaction to it yet. So um, I'm hoping that there's just not quite enough alpaca in here for me to be sensitive to and to have a reaction to. Um, I, once, I, once I'm wearing it, it's fine. It's just the working with it and having it up around my face that seems to be the issue. So here is the beginnings of wool and honey. I don't know if I have this lined up properly or not. 
Um, I had started this before and it was just way too tight and my gauge was off and nothing was working and blah, blah, blah. So I have fixed that now and I'm off to the races. I, you, you're supposed to start with a tubular cast on and work your ribbing for your collar, just like this one. And of course it gives you that lovely cast on edge. I mean, it just looks so nice. But um, I always find, and it's the same with this, the necklines end up too big. And my Lunenburg, the neckline is a little bit too big and it's a little bit too forgiving. Um, and I find like, I just, I like my, I like to be able to wear a t-shirt underneath and I tightened this up. I don't know if you guys remember, but I took yarn, the same colorway, same yarn, and I looped it through the top of the tubular cast on and I tightened it until I was happy with the tightness of the collar, which lifts the sweater up as well. So it's not as long as it was originally because I had already lengthened it and then I added more length. Um, and if I were to do this again, I probably would even add a little bit more length. Um, <laughs> are you seeing a theme here? So with this, um, I cast it on, that first cast on had to rip it out. And then can you believe it, last night, I think it was the storm and James was at tutoring and so on and so forth. Um, I did all of the short row shaping at the back of the neck here and I realized when it was done, it was all in stockinette and it's supposed to be in garter. <laughs> so I was all the way down here and I had to rip it all back out and I re-knit it while James was at tutoring. So like go figure. So now I'm into the interesting part, into the actual honeycombs. The sweater, the sweater yoke makes great, these great honeycombs and then it's garter for the rest of the body. So I might die um, having to knit all of that garter, but it will save my wrist because there's no purling. Because purling seems to be what really upsets my wrists. So um, it's just the way I hold my yarn and the way I hold the sweater and stuff. So anyhow, we're off to the races for that. And it's nice to work with a different yarn because this yarn is, um, it's, it's a it's a sport weight. Um, it's got a bit of a halo to it from that alpaca in there. It's nicely spun. Um, uh, it's a woolen woolen yarn. Um, it's got a, it's got a nice hand to it. Um, I would use this actually to model like some hand spun off of it, like if, un, untwisting it and and uh, figure out how many twists are in the singles, how many twists are in the in the ply, and model. I, I, I quite like this yarn. It's it's a nice yarn. So. I think that's it for my projects. I feel like that's quite a bit. <laughs> um, hopefully you guys are still with me. <laughs> mm. Dagmar, of course, again, with the logic. <laughs> she said, if you knit the garter in the round, of course, you'll have to purl. Of course, you have to purl every other round, duh. Um, I totally forgotten about that. I was thinking about garter like flat. Um, so yes, good point. I will have to, I will have to, um, Pearl. <laughs> you guys are so funny. Uh, Vicky says funny because I like big, big necklines. I know it's so funny, like what, what each of us likes and what we're drawn to. Um, I find with the big necklines, um, for me, as soon as they get any bigger than this, you can see my bra because my bra is right here. And I just don't like to be constantly like lifting my sweater up to cover my bra line. And, um, so I guess it's just something that, and the thing is I always had to wear for swimming when I was, when I was still um, swimming, um, I always had to wear a uh, racer back. And so you always had that line going here of the racer back. And I guess it's just stuck with me, um, wanting to like, not always look like I'm in sport, in sp like sport stuff. I don't know. <laughs> Go figure. Yeah. Thank you, Pam. This is, um, it's a, it, it's hand glazed. It's not, the mug isn't handmade, but it's hand glazed. You can get them in, uh, uh, Jasper, uh, Jasper National Park. They sell them. I just wove the arm of my chair into my card weaving. Too much distraction from the awesome sweater details. Oh no, Charlotte, what are you going to do? <laughs> what are you going to do? Um, thank you so much, Bridget. She says, um, I love that shawl that you're wearing. Thank you so much. It's the Sparks of Grey um, by Melanie Berg. I put it on because I'm because I'm cold. I don't actually wear shawls that much. That's why I don't knit them very often. Um, Glenda, who's here, um, she knit an absolutely stunning Sparks of Grey, um, and her contrast yarn and the main yarn. It was her hand. It was hand spun. Oh, it was just beautiful. If you guys follow on. Um, in, on uh, the Slack channel, she had she had posted it in there. It was a while ago. I feel like it was back in the fall or the summer. Anyways, hers was amazing. It was absolutely beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. All right. 
let's do community participation. That's not the right one. Let's just cue this up properly. Okay, this is from Laura. So um, we're gonna, we're sort of doing this a little bit differently. So I hope that um, you guys are um, happy. Oh, Charlotte, she's unweaving. Oh dear, I hope that that goes well. So this is from Laura. She was sharing, um, I was definitely not going to buy any fleece, fiber, or yarn of any kind as my stash is full, but when I saw someone selling gray fin fleece in a Finnish Spinners Facebook group, I couldn't resist. Gray fin, and then there's the Finnish name for it, which actually is the raw fiber wool that I'm processing. I, I was saying to spin group this morning, I have to get my gray fin back on my wheel. Um, it's been sitting for quite a while. Um, it was a gift from, from Amber, who's a member of our community. And I, I just haven't gotten back to it after doing a whole bunch of sampling and figuring out how to spin it. And I have to get it spun because I, I just don't want it to languish and to sit for too, too much longer. And so after I'm finished spinning all of the luxury fiber stuff for the School of Sweet Georgia, th this is my priority is this, this fiber. Um, it's a breed of its own and is all, and it, what it was, um, almost extinct when in the 1980s someone started to save it. Now there are a little over 1100 ewes. I've never spun it before and as far as I know you can't get it as a prepared top or bat. Um, so I jumped at it and bought 1.5 kilos as it was a re as it was really cheap. The box uh, full of fleece already cleaned a VM arrived today at 8 p.m. I really wanted to test it right away. It felt so soft and the locks are so pretty. So I washed a little of it, spun it in the washer, probably shouldn't have it felt it a little bit. And as I really, really wanted to spin it, I dried it a tiny bit with a hand dryer. <laughs> Laura was very motivated to get this onto the wheel. I love it. Um, then she speed carded it with my hand cards and even speedier spun it long draw. It was the easiest long draw for me so far. And at 11 p.m., I had a tiny unwashed skein of gray fin. I love it. I hope I'll have time to start working on the remaining 1,495 grams soon. <laughs> It's amazing. Thank you for sharing, Laura. And Ashley, it'll be really fun to see your progress because this is something that I would like to get working on as well. So we'll sort of have the same project going at the same time. This is from Caitlin. Uh, first hand spun sweater done. I love the collar on this sweater. I just think it is absolutely fantastic. And it was really fun reading along with her as she finished this because there were a couple of posts that she had put up in the Zero to Hero uh, thread on Ravelry before she posted this final photo. In spite of all the flaws that I can see, I'm still ridiculously proud of the result. I wanted to spin and knit this sweater as soon as I saw the pattern. Natural colors, a beautiful yoke, lots of room to modify the body and sleeves for my perfect relaxed fit. I couldn't resist. Between the added thickness of the float from the floats and the corrugated ribbing, it's so cozy I may not take it off until summer. The yarn is two ply hovering around a heavy sport weight and is my first attempt to sustain a particular wraps per inch over a long spin. I could ramble on, but suffice to say this sweater was a huge learning experience. I can't wait to start my next sweater spin. Amazing. This is great, Caitlin. Thank you for sharing. And um, I've put the hashtags down below of the different alongs that this is part of. So our you know sweater spin, um, our zero to hero, this could also go under our natural shades along, the same as the last one. Um, these are sort of all the different things that we have going on in the community. This is from Dana, this makes my heart sing. And Dana's here today, so shower her with love and appreciation of this amazing sweater. So this is, she, um, 
I had, I had spun a three ply from a CVM fleece that I got from Gaylene in Colorado. So quite a few of us have those fleeces. Um, I processed it and spun it back in 2021. I started this cardigan gentle morning last March and it only got worked on here and there. I finished it this morning by finally sewing on the buttons. We've had some cloudy, cool weather, so I'm wearing it today. I'm really happy with it, although I feel it could fit better through the underarms. My plan was to try it on after separating for the sleeves and I didn't. Oh well, I'm going to wear it a lot. Um, this is amazing. I love this. And yes, I agree, Rebecca, you look so happy and proud. Yay, Dana. Beautiful first sweater, Caitlin from Ruth. Um, just incredible, you guys. Two unbelievable sweaters. Fantastic. This is actually also from Caitlin. Um, she's been using her spindle spun skeins from the summer in some small projects and she recently finished, it says here uh, her first socks, um, which was also in the post in the photo, but what I, but she also posted this great photo of her, um, of her fingerless mitts. And I wanted to share that cause I just thought it was beautiful. These mitts are just fantastic with that twisted rib and that lace pattern, um, going up the center. They are really, really effective. So just beautiful job, Caitlin. And yay for using up, uh, small skeins <laughs> and spindle spun, no less. So just fantastic. You are on a roll, says Charlotte. Beautiful. This is from Denise. I, <laughs> you guys just bowl me over, like between your sweaters that you knit and the spindle spun yarns that you guys do. Like, look at this. Isn't this amazing? This speaks for itself. This Shetland hand spun told me it wanted to be a, the Belraid shawl, I think Belraid shawl, uh, sorry, hat, rather than what I had originally planned. At first I thought I'd be cutting it close on yarn as I hadn't made this style of shawl before. When I realized I had more than enough, I added another repeat of lace. It is plenty big now and so light and airy. Isn't this incredible? And I love that contrasting border. Very effective. There's a shawl on my in my queue that I have wanted to make forever. Do you guys remember uh, Jared Flood's pattern Juneberry? I love that shawl and I never knit it. And um, I have to admit when I saw this, I immediately thought of that shawl and I thought, you know, I really need to pull that out and take it with us like when we go on a road trip or something where it's what I have to work on and I can really like focus on it um, and focus on, on um, the lace in that and just really embrace it and enjoy it. Yeah. Becca says haps are my fave. Yes. Rebecca says, uh, wow, that's jaw dropping. Some stunning work people says Allison. Yes. I love that shawl so, so much. The work that you guys do and that you share, it just never ceases to amaze. This is from Rebecca. This is really fun. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to read the whole thing because it's it's um, uh, really helpful actually if you do read it. But basically, Rebecca's been guy leading. Um, it was just sort of a grassroots thing. Um, this sock color study. So one of her goals this year was that she wanted to um, spin for socks and she wanted to play around with different yarn structures and colors and really try to learn about what makes sock yarn, sock yarn, and what works and what doesn't work. Um, you know, we've talked a little bit, she's been um, blogging about it, and uh, it's been really fun to watch other people jump on the bandwagon as well. So she says here, so you know those yarns that Rachel mentions in the radio podcast, so that's Woolen Spinning Radio. Um, the Woolen Spinning Radio podcast is part of the Patreon, so if you join, everybody gets access to it. Um, and most of the shows are also available on YouTube. There's a link in the post and then you can watch the Wool and Spinning Radio episode if you prefer video, um, where I say that it's just plain over twisted. I think I made one of those. So if you look at the um, upper right-hand corner here, that, that grape colored purple yarn, um, it was an opposing ply yarn and she has so many questions. Some of it is a hot mess, but I had drive band slippage at 30 to one and didn't notice it for a while. So the singles, have much less twist than they are supposed to. Maybe fixing that would fix everything, but I also found that because the opposing ply was tightening and plying, while the other two plies were untwisting, the other two plies tended to puff up and twist around the opposing ply. 
So some of it looks very boucle-ish. I think the other thing I would say about opposing th uh, three plies, opposing four plies, however many you want to do. Um, what I've really noticed, and we were actually talking about this this morning in spin group, um, is that just like in commercial socks where you've got the nylon, um, you know, you've got a cotton nylon blend, for example, in a commercial sock, maybe that you've, you know, bought the socks somewhere. And slowly over time, as you wear those socks, the nylon wears away the cotton and it almost kind of abrades it away so that eventually you have this web left of just nylon. I've really noticed that that's what's happened with my opposing three ply socks. And it's almost like that really tightly twisted single in there. It just kind of abrades. That said, the opposing three ply was the fastest to break down in one of the issues of ply magazine. She did a belt sander over top and the opposing three ply was the first one to go, which is really interesting. So was it the yarn? Was it that particular blend? Was it that particular wool? Was it the way that it was knit? Was it the way it was spun? Who knows? There's too many factors, but it is interesting that it, that it's maybe not as tough as we think that it is. And I do think that there is something to the fact that you're actually changing twist directions in the yarn. And yes, it can be a beast. Um, so then um, she's got the blue yarn here. Um, then I made we these wee skeins and two more, enough for another pair by breaking up two braids of the same colorway that went from green to purple. Um, the per the blue-green half I spun in a traditional three-ply construction, so we'll see how they compare to knit and wear. Taken as pairs, these two yarns have identical yards per pound and are pretty darn close on weight and yardage, so at least I know my spinning is overall consistent. Rebecca is a very consistent spinner. <laughs> you don't give yourself enough credit sometimes. Um, <clears throat> another hypothesis, could it be that BFL, even superwash BFL, is not a great candidate for opposing ply yarns since it doesn't hold as much twist as the finer wools? Maybe... I think it has more to do with the twist and the twist direction, to be honest. Um, it seems like they will curly cue before you go uh, past 40 degrees or so. I would agree with that. They do curly cue very quickly. And hauser yarn, same thing. They get really, really uh, curly cue. So, yeah, it'll be really interesting when she gets spinning to see, or sorry, when she gets knitting to see what her reflections are. Because I found the hauser four ply and the opposing three ply, they were not easy to knit with. They weren't really hard, but they weren't super easy. So I, I'm curious to see what Rebecca reports back. This is from Ellen. Um, I have not made yarn yet. However, I did dig out the fiber I was thinking of. Turns out it is a border lister and it's not BFL. Um, not letting that stop me before I started combing. I have spun some singles. I'm hoping for a four ply in the end. And she's actually working on her sock spinning as well. So this is what that's for. I'm such a slow spinner to many other things um, they get in the way. I it doesn't help that I have big feet. Everyone's yarns and socks are so nice. So this is for the, um, I, I put this under natural shades along as well, because this is just a beautiful natural color of the, of the border lister, but it's also for the sock study as well. And I'm not sure if Ellen is going to dye the singles and the yarn and stuff. Like I'm not sure what her plan is, but oh my goodness, this would just be beautiful. Yeah, absolutely, Rebecca. She said they're supposed to be really elastic, which is good for socks, I guess. Um, I, I would absolutely agree with that. The nice, the more elastic your yarns are, the better they're going to fit your feet. Um, but I am finding that some of these really high twist yarns, we were talking about this in Spin Grip this morning, these really, really high twist yarns, they also seem to wear really quickly. Um, and I think it's just that the, the fibers are under so much um, torque. You know, they're, they're under a lot of force and a lot of tension. So I do wonder um, about that. This is from Brittany. This is kind of something different. So this is null binding, um, a craft that I've wanted to try for some time. It's super fun. And once you get the hang of it, excuse me, it's a really nice craft that I'm enjoying, especially when I want a mental break. Null binding is an ancient Viking way of creating fabric. It will not unravel, which is amazing, yet it's annoying if you make a mistake because you literally have to like unsew. Um, I asked her if it uses more yarn than uh, knitting and she said yes, that she seemed, that she sort of noticed that it does use a bit more yarn. Um, and I asked if it was kind of more like the amount of yarn that like crochet would use. So um, just, you know, if you're gonna play with this, it does use a bit more yarn, but isn't that cool? So 
Yes, isn't that so true? Rebecca, Rebecca says uh, the, the sock sweet, sweet spot is a moving target. Absolutely it is. I think it depends on the fiber. It depends on which wool you're using. Are you using a blend? How tightly is it spun? Is it multiply? Um, what are you knitting it at? I've talked about this before on the podcast, but somebody had said, um, had done their, their master's uh, spinning thesis, their, their final project on sock yarn, and they spun and knit just a ton of socks. And they took them up to Fort Mac in Northern Alberta um, on the oil sands, and they gave them to a bunch of the guys to wear in their work boots. The only socks that lasted were the ones that were, had silk in them. I don't know, I don't know. Something to think about. <laughs> This was a question that Amanda had. So she said, I'm a fairly new spinner. She's actually since started spinning because she shared it on the Slack channel. Um, and I'm looking for your thoughts. I have some beautiful merino silk top and this is my first time spinning fiber where the colors run lengthwise, so up and down, along the entire length of the top. So my question is, how would you spin this if it was yours? So there were some really good uh, suggestions and feedback and one of the things that came up almost immediately was the fact that this is an, an is an analogous colorway um, there is no red in here there is no uh, there is a little bit of yellow because there's some yellow that was used to make that lime green color but there's no red so it's an analogous colorway you've got that movement of that royal blue through to some of those tealy greens and that lime green and that lighter teal blue and then there's of course that white through there no matter how you spin this, you cannot go wrong because it's going to make a really pleasing yarn because it's analogous. So the question becomes how much barber polling do you want? How blended do you want it to appear? Um, several of us had suggested just stripping it down and spinning it end to end. Other people had suggested taking it by staple length. So where you actually unfold, um, undo it, um, you know, if the fiber, it's obviously way thicker than this, but you just take a, take a staple length off and spin it over the fold. And then you'd get a sort of a semi woolen yarn and you would then be able to, um, uh, you know, so you're changing the prep a little bit, um, but you get a really light lofty airy yarn. It would be quite elastic because of that Merino in there. And, um, you'd have that really nice blending of the colors through the whole yarn. So people had several different thoughts and, um, I, I just thought it was really beautiful and something to think about. I personally would probably strip it down and spin it. Um, if I was a really new spinner and just getting started, that's probably what I would have done now, uh, being the spinner that I am now and with the knowledge that I have, um, the experiments that I've done where things have gone right and things have gone wrong. What I would do now is I would actually keep it folded up. I wouldn't, I wouldn't lay it out and, and, and put it out into sort of more of like the bat. Um, it's not a bat, it's comb top, but out laid out. I would actually probably fold it back up. Um, and I would spin it across the top. So I would spin it sort of across so that you're getting all those colors and almost kind of like a combo drafted yarn. That's what I would do. So it'll be fun to see what she makes because she can't go wrong. It's going to be beautiful no matter what. And then finally, this is from Becca. Um, she has been starting her Raimi samples. So this is part of her uh, spinning certificate that she's working on. She'd only spun it in blends before and she's realizing that she has no idea how much twist she wants to add. For those who have spun Raimi, what does your plyback look like? How much twist do you prefer? And it feels so different from flax that I am also working on. It's fun to be in a totally new territory. And actually I talked to her about this yesterday. And uh, we, we, she was saying, we were, we were sort of saying together, uh, one of the things about spinning some of these fibers is they're just so not like wool. They're totally different. It's like spinning something completely foreign and that's part of the fun. Um, and they're, they're very planty. And one of the things that we were both reflecting on is the fact that they're not fast. They don't spin quickly. Cotton is not a fast spin. Linen or flax is not a fast spin. Like these fibers take a bit longer and, um, you think that they need all of this twist to hold together and they do, but because of that, they also want to spin fine. So you sort of end up with these really fine singles and then you end up with these really fine yarns and the bast fibers traditionally are, are spun and plied as two plies. And, um, you know, if you can do a really nice consistent job with the Raimi, uh, it just makes a really, really cool yarn and really beautiful. So I put this under, um, our, our luxury fibers along as well as our natural fibers along. So 
super fun. All these things, we have so much to talk about, so much to spin, there's never any shortage. I know my dad used to say to me, aren't you gonna run out of stuff to talk about eventually? And I was like, no, <laughs> never. <laughs> There's always something else. Look at how much we can talk about wool. Like if I made the podcast only about wool, we would never run out of things to talk about. So that's pretty cool. And then you put in all the plant-based fibers, you put in all the luxury fibers, all the wonderful ways of blending and recreating and remaking stuff. I mean, it's just amazing, amazing. So I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your week. Um, Yes, silk and socks is debated. I'm sure it depends on the type of silk. I'm not sure it depends on the type of silk. Um, I, I think silk just in and of itself is a very strong fiber. Um, it's warm. And uh, I think that it's gonna add strength no matter what. Like it's almost like putting in nylon, right? Um, I think you could put in Tessa, you could put in Mulberry, you could put in Muga. Um, I don't know why you'd want to put in Muga. It's just so, it's so luxurious, <laughs> but you know, throw in Tessa and, and right, right there, you've, you've made it stronger. Um, especially if you're looking for a nylon alternative and you don't want to do a nylon blend, you could put in mohair. Um, mohair will strengthen your socks up like that. And I don't know if that spinning certificate, if that person used mohair or not in some of the blends, I have no idea. I don't know any of the details. So, um, yeah. Good night, Becca get some sleep. Um, but yeah, I mean, right there, just adding some, some silk into your yarns. And of course, silk wants a certain amount of twist. Um, but it doesn't have to be like, you know, exorbitant amounts to make, to make it strong. So, you know, blend it really nicely through the whole thing, really evenly and spin your yarns on the higher twist side. And I think you've probably got a pretty good blend there that will, will, uh, um, last. So, my Raimi felt like it took forever too. If you still want plyback tests, I can dig up mine from 51 yarns. Oh, that'd be cool, Rebecca. And um, I'm sure we can find them actually in the Ravelry thread. I'm sure they're still there. So yeah, I always wonder about perspiration in the silk, with the silk and socks. Um, and they would be really warm. Like I often wonder about perspiration just in general um, in socks. Like the, I feel like the warmer and woolier and bigger they are, like even sometimes with, with slippers that I've knit, I feel like your feet just sweat, you know? And um, from recent experience with moths, you definitely want to try to minimize the um, body oils and the body sweat and the body odor and stuff in your in your knits when you're storing stuff. So make sure that stuff's washed and that it's clean when you're putting it away or put it in, you know, they'll get through it if they really want to, but put it in, um, you know, bags and stuff. So definitely some other aspects to think about for sure. I am going to say goodbye because I need to get to the kids' school to pick them up. And I also need to do a couple of errands on the way because, like, that's really fun. <laughs> so I hope that you guys have a wonderful couple of weeks. And I will see you same time, same place in two weeks. And I actually do have an episode of Welford Weaves for you guys. And that will premiere at the same time next week on Tuesday um, at 12 noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. So, um Oh, that's so interesting, Glenda. I have a pair of hand spun socks with south down in silk. A worn spot only has the silk left. That's so interesting. So it's kind of abraded a um, the south down and it's gone. Yeah, silk degrades with perspiration. Abs yeah, so that kind of goes back to that whole cleanliness thing, right? And making sure that your socks are washed and clean. Yeah, so, and Rebecca said it's it can't be any worse than nylon. Um, everything with nylon acrylic polyester makes me sweat, right? Because it doesn't breathe. Yeah, 100%. Okay, guys, we could go on forever. So have a wonderful rest of your day. And I hope it's sunny and warm wherever you are because it certainly isn't here. <laughs> and until next time, happy spinning. And I'll talk to you on the other side. Bye, guys.